Testing. Okay. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's two minutes past two, so I think we will just slowly start. I would like to invite Dr. Jude Ta from Stockholm University to join me, if I may, please. And thanks to uh, Dr. Ta, uh, we can have this wonderful conference today, so thank you for joining me. And this will be your microphone. And I'll just make some formal uh, welcome note, but I'll try to keep it brief. So, dear distinguished guests, uh, dear colleagues, welcome to the Maria Grzegorzewska University in Warsaw for the international conference supporting the social inclusion of children and young people with intellectual and developmental disability, the importance of the interdisciplinary approach. A warm welcome goes to all of you, and I would like to introduce uh, in particular our conference partners, Dr. Jutta from Stockholm University, uh, and representatives of the Research Council 25 on Language and Society from the International Sociological Association, uh, Stephanie Kasilde and Erzbarat Barat, who are here with us. Uh, many members of our association are watching us, are watching live transmission from this event. I also extend my welcome to representatives of Polish Educational Research Association and to all those who will receive special awards today at 15.15 but I will not reveal yet who that is. During the conference, we are launching a new book in the UNESCO Chair Book Series, edited by Dr. Eva Dombrova and available online in open access, uh, Acceptance, Participation, Solidarity, where you can find many of our attendees' chapters. Every year, on March 21st, people throughout the world wear brightly colored, mismatched socks to honor a special World Down Syndrome Day. March 21st is significant because people with Down syndrome have three copies of their 21st chromosome. And also, 21st of March is also the first day of a calendar spring, and therefore it is a symbolic day to hold our conference on. The cycle of life, new life, new hope, new knowledge for better support of people with disabilities. The EU-funded project, Removal of Barriers to Social Inclusion for People with IDD, brings together scholars from seven European universities to promote interprofessional collaboration and international cooperation for building more inclusive communities of the future. But our first keynote speakers of the day will tell you more about it in just a moment. Let me introduce once again <laughs> Dr. Jutta from Stockholm University and also Professor Michael Brown from Queen's Mary University in Belfast. They are accompanied with other project team uh, members comprising of Professor Anna Perkoska Kleiman, uh, Professor Julian Kiss from Oradia University, uh, Gamu uh, from um, Hartfordshire University, um, uh, Professor Rolf Magnus Grung from uh, Oslomet, Sam Abdullah from Napier University in Edinburgh, Paul. Uh, from Queens, and I think I just leave, leave you to it. Anyway, dear colleagues, without you, we would not have this wonderful event, so thank you all, and the floor is yours. I think I'm not that nice looking, so you don't need to see me. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Lovely welcome. Great to be back in beautiful Warsaw. It's much warmer this time than it was when I was here last. It was very, very cold. Um, I've been many times and it's always nice to be here. So Jude and I are going to do a little bit of a walkthrough of the background and the context to the study and the project that we've been involved in. So thank you to our lovely hosts here at Maria Grosch-Groschka University in Poland. That's the best I can do, sorry. It sounds like we're going to do a little bit of karaoke. So this is me here. I've been involved in the Erasmus Plus projects for nearly 15 years and we're going to talk about, I think it's the fourth one that we've done and um, really interesting but I want to contextualize the work that we have done and think globally about children and young adults with intellectual disabilities, 
these young people that we are particularly concerned about, but they're a subpopulation of the global population. So just broadly, European Union, 74, three quarters of a billion people. And we, we were thinking when we were planning this project about these children and young adults with very complex neurodevelopmental issues. And what were some of the challenges that were facing them and their families, people within education, in social care and in health care? So the populations of the countries that were involved in this project, we have lovely Norway there and we have Rolf Magnus somewhere here. So just under 5 million people in Norway, Sweden about 10 million people, Romania 21 million, England huge 51 million, Northern Ireland where I'm from very small, the smallest just under 2 million, Scotland 5 million and then you add all them together and you think well what is it like for children and young adults with intellectual disabilities living in Norway, Sweden, Romania, Poland, England, Wales, that was what we were interested in and what do these populations look like? So we were interested in life expectancy, and I found this slide and it's fascinating. So globally, 250 years ago roughly, your life expectancy in 1800 was 31 years. And then you see life events like famine, the Spanish flu 120 years ago, we've just lived through a global pandemic. Poland massively affected by the Second World War. And then you go forward about 200 years and you can see that life expectancy has more than doubled. So what does that mean for children and adults with intellectual disabilities? Well we know that for example children with Down syndrome, very common intellectual disability, around 1900 their life expectancy was 10 years old. So we didn't see many people with Down syndrome 125 years ago living into adulthood but this situation has changed dramatically and it was that context that we were particularly interested in. We're interested in life expectancy. So if you look across the EU over nearly a 25 year period, you can see that life expectancy for males and females has gone up markedly, a slight dip in the past couple of years, but life expectancy has gone up by about eight to 10 years over a 20 year period. So we were interested, well, what does that mean for children and young people with intellectual disabilities as a subpopulation of the general population. So these were some of the questions when we were planning this project that we were interested in and what did this mean? And here you can see that there's projected population changes. So some countries like Scotland, where Sam is from, they're gonna have a decreasing, a decreasing general population. But Ireland, for example, where I am, has an increasing an increasing population. And you'll see uh, other countries there, Sweden um, and, and England and others who've been a part of our project. So what does this mean? If life expectancy is increasing, if populations are increasing, what does this mean for intellectual and developmental disabilities? Our governments across the EU on a global basis, as populations age, the things that they are really concerned about is cancer, which tends to affect older people. Coronary heart disease, particularly common due to diet, poor exercise and things like that. And this then can lead to strokes to increase blood, blood, um, uh, blood pressure issues. So governments understandably from a social policy point of view, from a health policy point of view, all the countries where we are, our governments are concerned with these issues and understandably so. But we're thinking, well, how does these issues then affect children and young adults with intellectual disabilities? So what do we know? The research evidence on a global basis, and many of you here I understand work in special education. So this will be your core role. We're seeing increasing complexity of children and young adults with intellectual disabilities surviving into older age. But older age is still 30 to 40 years shorter than people in the general population. So if we go back to one of the slides earlier, life expectancy on average across the EU is about 82 to 85 years. But this means that for children and adults with intellectual and developmental issues, it will be 30 to 40 years shorter. 
we're seeing increasing scientific advances in recognizing rare syndromes. All these rare genetic syndromes where there may be half a dozen of them in Poland and a hundred of them across the EU, they have specific learning profiles, specific learning needs, specific support needs. We're seeing increasing numbers of autism spectrum disorder children children with ADHD, fetal alcohol spectrum, and a range of neuropsychiatric issues. So this is the complexity that we were interested in as researchers and educators. We were looking at the research evidence of this growing and changing population of children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Within this wider context, all our countries had signed up to the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disability, and we were interested, well, what does this mean for children, adults, and older people with intellectual disabilities within a wider population of people with, people with all kinds of disabilities, whether it be sensory impairments, physical disability, mental impairments, we were interested in children and young adults with intellectual and developmental uh, um, issues. So across the EU member states, this uh, convention has been widely adopted and it helps set the context for some of the challenges that we set ourselves regarding the social inclusion of these children and young adults with very complex needs. So what do we know? The evidence is that the vast majority of these children and young adults are cared for at home. In some countries, there have been slight blips where there was institutions and all sorts of different things happened. But historically, by and large, families want to care for their family member with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We know because of their education needs, their health needs, their social care needs, their respite needs, their high and frequent users of education services, often special education, health services and social care, that they're living longer, many of them with multiple physical, mental health and behavioral complex needs, and that these conditions that they present with and their learning needs will be life lifelong. And that we're also seeing a population of children and young adults with very complex physical health needs where interventions and technological support is required to sustain life. And I've worked with school teachers who've said that the classroom is becoming like a mini hospital and a mini intensive care because of the complexity of some of the children. And we know that these needs are, are layered. So all the children have education needs. Some of them will be special education needs with behavioral support needs. They will need to ask, access primary care services, pediatric services, emergency department services, social care services, respite services. So what we were interested in in this project that we're going to share with you was how do we, as professionals who work in education, health care and social care, how do we plan and coordinate care and support now and in the future? And how do we draw on all our knowledge and skills and expertise to ensure that we're trying to support the inclusion and ordinary lives of these children and young adults, particularly those with very, very complex care needs? So what we're seeing is preterm neonates who previously would have died, maybe about 20 weeks. A normal gestation, as people will know, is about 38 to 40 weeks. So we're seeing severe prematurity, interventions to sustain life, severe physical disabilities, cerebral palsy, blindness, hearing impairments, epilepsy, gastrointestinal issues. This is what some of you who work in education and healthcare will be seeing as your everyday work role. Children with very complex needs, uh, growing needs that require family-centered supports and supports from education, other services. The other issue that we're seeing for these preterm babies is behavioral, emotional, and psychiatric issues commonly. So we're seeing issues like fetal alcohol spectrum issues linked with ADHD, often of the inattention kind, emotional problems, ASD, increased risk of anxiety disorders and depression, impulsivity, issues like this. So this is what's coming into the classroom 
if you're special education teachers. And this is the context of our study and the work that we did. We were interested in how we promote social inclusion for children with very complex needs because we recognised that the picture across all our countries was one sometimes of social exclusion. So this is what we were concerned about. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Ta. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Brown, for setting up the context and giving you some backgrounds on the kind of issues that we grappled with in terms of planning and formulating uh, the project. Uh, we, as Micah mentioned earlier, we've worked together almost 15 years when we first met and decided that we like each other that much and we want to collaborate and still like each other and we've been doing that all these years and this is actually the fourth project that we have uh, implemented together. Uh, I will basically focus on this, the last project which is in line with the, this conference that we're having today. And based on all these different issues that Michael uh, just mentioned, we thought how do we address this particular problem in terms of bringing together people from different disciplines and professional groups uh, to try to see how we can uh, uh, enable and facilitate social inclusion and participation for these children and young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, based on that and the initial projects that we've done together, so we thought this would be a logical progression in our consortium and the work in the consortium uh, to grapple with this particular issue. We had looked at inclusion uh, before in other projects, but then we are more focused on looking at uh, inclusion, social inclusion, broadening it up a little bit, and social participation for this particular group. But in terms of how we could do that uh, through interprofessional practice or approach. And we basically had two different ways we thought about that. That could happen through practice, but then we also thought it's as important to develop some kind of interprofessional interprofessional education such that we reunite uh, students from all different these disciplines that we work with to come together at some point and study together and try to see how we could coordinate in terms of sharing knowledge and practices pre-professional uh, when they are still studying at the university. So we thought that would be a good way to go in terms of building and sustaining this interprofessional collaboration to support the social inclusion and participation of children and young people with IV. Yeah, so these different challenges of today are also challenges of tomorrow. And uh, in action today would have devastating effects on their social inclusion. So we were more interested in a, a solution-based approach to uh, dealing with this issue. And it was about how do we remove the barriers to social inclusion and participation uh, for these children and young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that became also the, the, the title of the project that we uh, planned together, wrote the application, submitted, and got funded uh, for a three years project uh, addressing these different issues. But what actually were we looking at and interested in knowing? Michael talked about the partnership and as well as um, uh, Professor uh, Anna Odrowa's quote. quote. <laughs> yeah, we have problems uh, pronouncing Polish words but we'll try and we've been working the last how many years today? Yeah, and we still have difficulties with that. But these are the universities that participated in the, in the project which phased out uh, last year and all the project partners are represented here today and we'll get the chance to, for you to get to meet and talk to them uh, during dinner and in other kind of informal uh, breaks or coffee breaks that we'll have. So what did we actually do within the framework of uh, this project, the removal of barriers to social inclusion and participation? We're mainly focused on three primary goals, and that was the development of what we call an interprofessional curriculum resource. And that resource was to put together uh, different kinds of uh, knowledge and information, both literature, but other kind of relevant uh, information that could be used by higher education institutions, but other kind of organizations in terms of developing uh, educational curricula that could be uh, uh, delivered to students or 
other group of individuals that work with and support children with intellectual disabilities. So we wanted to make that an open resource that people could access and uh, find different kinds of resources. Then we're also interested in producing some scientific articles as well. We all work within uh, academia and research is an integral part of our work. So, but then it's also a way of producing and disseminating uh, relevant knowledge within the subject area. Uh, and then based on the fact that we wanted this uh, education, joint education and shared learning between students from all the participating institutions, so we also decided to implement, uh, implement what we call an interprofessional intensive course. So this is a course that will bring together students from all different universities within the different disciplines and they will meet together we will meet together in one of the partner universities for a period of two weeks where we will deliver a 7.5 credit course. And in that students would work not only internationally but across professions. So we designed the course uh, taking in mind the need for collaboration and the need for them to uh, uh, discuss and share knowledge and practices as well as identifying priority areas within their different profession in terms of how they could collaborate uh, to provide effective services and support the social inclusion of the children and young uh, persons with, or young adults with intellectual disabilities. So those were the three main things that we, we, we did in the implementation phase of the project, which uh, lasted until 2022. I will talk a little bit more about uh, those uh, three different things here. I will start first with the inter professional intensive course. And we, the initial plan was that we would have three of these different courses in three of our partner universities. The first year was in 20, 2020 in Oradia, and that was the onset of the, the COVID. So we were actually, the first week of having the, the IP, the intensive program, uh, then the pandemic kind of became of global and interest and boundaries were closing, so we had to evacuate all the students from Oradia back to their different countries as well as the teachers, which was rather unfortunate, but we had the first part of the intensive program on campus at the University of Oradia, and we later on uh, transmigrated it online. I think we were one of the first to actually do that because we sent back students two days after we had online uh, teaching to continue and uh, delivering the delivering of the delivering of the course. So, uh, 2021, the course was supposed to actually hold the year at the university. Unfortunately, due to pandemic and all the different restrictions, we couldn't have that uh, course. But the last one held in Belfast, was it right? Oh, Edinburgh. Edinburgh, Edinburgh was it in 2022. So we still had students from all our different universities. In total, we had 147 students who participated in the two intensive programs that were organized and all of them completed the course and we delivered 7.5 uh, uh, credits at their different universities. So it was a very big uh, success. It not, it not just at the level of students and student knowledge, but also the exchange between us teachers we had other teachers who are unfortunately not able to be here today, but we had rich discussions and a lot of exchange of ideas and practices across the different countries in a, in a bit to how to identify ways of how to support social inclusion rather than seeing what necessarily comparing countries and seeing which is better than the other. So it was a shared learning exercise. And the students were very happy and there, from the feedback we received from students, most of them were very explicit that it was the best experience in their lives ever. And just a little bit of an anecdote that it, uh, I, for those of you who are so interested in current affairs, a few years ago we had uh, an incident with uh, a self-bombing incident in the center of Stockholm a few years ago. And actually the student that was on the picture on all international media was one of the students from Edinburgh, it was Sam, right? So who came to Stockholm to visit the Swedish students after they, 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 they met during the delivery of the course. So the course kind of not only developed their, their professional competence and professional knowledge, but also led to very strong social relationships such that they had maintained that even after the course was over. 
So at that level, it was both successful in terms of knowledge exchange, but as well as uh, developing social and uh, sustainable social relationship between students and teachers. But uh, we also, within the framework of the project, uh, produced a couple of scientific works as well, which you could see. And these are available as open resources on our project website on the open uh, educational resource. So if you are interested, you, you can have a look and read some of them. I think they'll be very useful in terms of the work we are doing today with social inclusion for children and young people with intellectual disabilities. Lastly, but not the least, as promised in the project application, we also delivered on the open online resource, which is also there and useful for all of us, both students and practi students practitioners, as, as well as academics within uh, the area of disabilities, especially IVD and social inclusion. There's a lot of information and material there that uh, you can uh, uh, have a look and it may be relevant in the kind of work that you do, both as students as well as academics and when we develop different kind of curricula that would be responsive to the need of social inclusion and participation. Uh, that's the website there. So, and you find the articles there and many other things that we've done within the project. So in, that was in a nutshell what we have been trying to do, uh, or we have done actually the last uh, uh, four years. The project phased out last year. We submitted the project final report, which was approved. And then we have continued with some dis dissemination uh, activities. And we had one last uh, two years ago in June in Belfast. That's a beautiful uh, campus of the Uni Queen's University in Belfast. So I found see where Michael works and where he sits and does no, his I private work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we had the conference at least in that building, so it was it was really beautiful. So yeah, so that was just in a nutshell uh, what we have done, and we will continue working on that. And we invite some of you who are interested as well in this issue. We think you are because you are here sitting with us today that we would also be, be very welcoming and open to having reflections and discussions with you for future collaboration. So thank you very much. Maybe if you have a question or two to us, we'll happily answer. Otherwise, we can have informal discussions with you later on. I can read the microphone if I move one. So you can keep one on one. So any questions to our professors? No? Now in this case, thank you very much indeed. One more. And we're doing very well with time. I don't want to, you know. Uh, uh, but now I would like to invite um, two keynote speakers from Austria, Professor Barbara Reiter and Professor Heike Wendt, who will talk to us about a completely different matter. Let me just close this. Um, here we go. First of all, I'd like to thank both professors for joining us today and taking a very green a travel option of a train. Well done. And here is a microphone for you. Yeah, thanks very much for having us. It's our first time in Warsaw and we are really excited. The train trip was quite an experience from Graz to Vienna and then from Vienna to here and the night in the hotel and the breakfast and then working on the slides until last moment, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and we are really excited to introduce you to our, uh, to, uh, to introduce some of our ideas to you 
um, it's called humanization of humanization. It's a thing that I've been thinking on on for a while. Um, but Heike joined me in the effort um, a year ago. She also invited me to go to northern Iraq with her, which was an expansion of horizon that I hadn't thought possible, actually. So I'm very grateful to be able to, to, to think together about it. I have a background in philosophy, Heike in pedagogy. And, and so it is exciting to put these two together. And this is actually the first time we are doing this. So we're also a little bit excited, of course. Wie gehe ich hier weiter? Thanks. So um, being a philosopher, I always want to give an overview before we get started. So first we define a, a, a horizon. Then we talk about, or I talk about the first two bits, defining a horizon, and then the idea of shared social practices. And I'm very grateful to Dr. Juta and to Michael Brown to give us the, the, Dewey, the Dewey quote, because we are also drawing on Dewey and uh, with the idea of the practice, of course, the shared practices. And then Heike will take over and talk about Mosul after ISIS, and the library, the theater, and the garden in Mosul. And then we draw conclusions. So pretty straightforward. So the humanization of humanization, defining a horizon, what are we talking about? Um, so we talk about shared social practices, which are based on good shared experiences as a starting point for improving, dem for improving democratic inclusive actions. And of course, consummatory experiences is an idea very prominent in Dewey. That means if you really enjoy and indulge in what you're doing in the moment, that actually adds to your good life as a person and helps, um, helps um, developing values that uh, can also be shared. So I could also say I am part of these practices and I experience my activity as a part of one whole society, which is, which, which is a community of values in a way. Um, I'm not going into the idea of values too deeply because this will carry us like away in 3,000 years of philosophy history, but it is of course an important notion. And I could also say I want to be part of this because it's fun to be part of this, which is like in pragmatist aesthetics a very important notion, and I'm also ready to do it and I'm able to do it because it feels good and I want to be part of this. And this is of course again the precondition for an active and working democracy. So how do we do this? Um, the idea of humanizing humanization is also answering as professionals in, in education, answering to a situation of different crises. And this is a plural, unfortunately. We have the climate crisis, we have different wars going on. We have still the, glo the, the, the situation of global injustice, of unjust um, um, attribution of, of goods. And we can be aware of it because we have a general digital and global presence. So we cannot pretend not to know about it. And since we can't not being humans, we can't stop being human, we can't say, okay, humans basically uh, did not a very good job, uh, we ruined the planet, so I become a cat, or I go to live in the woods. It's not an option, I mean, it's just not an option. So we have to work with, with what we got, which is a humanized planet. We, we are in the Anthropocene, and we have to cope with what we've done. So we have to come up with something. We have to answer to the crisis. So in a way, we want to save, um, in, in this project, we try out the theoretical option of saving humanism from the humans in a way by turning it into an ongoing critical and never ending process. It is meant to be enabling by giving space and keeping this space open. And of course it has to do with design, with maintenance and with participation. Recognition is key to it to be seen and to feel welcome. And we are, as I said already, building on good experiences by cultivating rounded selves that can take part in the cultural life of a society. So we have a very broad idea of conclusion, of inclusion, um, because we are asking which society enables radical equality. So three levels, being a philosopher, I can't help myself, but we have levels. So we have the highest level of intrinsic or moral values which are embedded in the human rights, but they are very abstract and universal. We have a second very broad level where, where we talk about pragmatic values, um, and that is actually the values that keep societies together. They can be different 
in different societies, but if you don't have some kind of shared values, the society falls apart. And then you have the conventional and individual values, and these are the actual practices. So now I come to the practices. What are shared social practices? They are part of the humanization process of humanization, and they are both material, as in buildings, and also not material or immaterial, as in practices or ideas. So what we want in these shared social practices is access and quality uh, that are enforced and enabled by the state as important public goods. Um, and they, they have to be accessible and, uh, and, and, and full of quality for everyone on their own account. So we are talking about the third spaces, not about the families, the first spaces and the second spaces, uh, schools, but we're talking about third spaces where people can reinvent themselves or find things worthwhile doing uh, for themselves. And thus we are enabling relationships and thus connectedness and empathy. I've seen there's a, a, there's a, there's a project on empathy going on. Unfortunately, it's in Polish, so empathy won't help to participate if the language isn't there, but very important connectedness. So the first shared social practices, I have three, as you might have, uh, might have judged from the uh, introductory remarks. We have the library, we have gardens, and we have uh, theatre. Um, so in the library, it, it, is, it is mostly about the cognitive self, but not only. It's also an, intergenera an, an intergenerational practice um, where I also can be alone with myself. Um, it is material in houses, in books, in shelves, in digital infrastructure, in the hardware, and it's immaterial as an orientation that is, that is, that is, um, that is actually uh, contained in data and also an order of things, to use this, uh, these words by Michel Foucault. Um, and here, here we have to be very aware of the quality of the archive data and information, which could be a state's, uh, a state's duty. But it's also about keeping the knowledge, which is not just cognitive, but also cultural in general. So it is about archives and storage. And of course, it, it enables my personal cognitive activity in engaging with knowledge. I am alone when I'm reading. And I put here a picture from my hotel room while I was preparing this, the last bit of the slides. So a computer, of course, is a library for us today. And we can be all by ourselves using uh, the approach um, or the, the, the entrance to our, to our shared libraries. It is, also, it is also an ongoing discourse uh, based on structures of recognition and it is the liability of a community, of a society, to actually critically supervise this provision of knowledge. It has to do with individual growth. Um, it is also about discussing with others from different times, from different backgrounds and contexts. And here, again, we have to make sure that there is access and also enabling by making people welcome to use it and to enter such a library. So theatre all together now, this is something we're doing together. Also here we have materially stages, we have houses, we have material places with a curtain, but it's also immaterial places like social media and streaming, the software. Um, it is always collaborative and social, and it is, can be putting on a utopia in a group with or without an audience and for an audience. This gives us opportunities to show ourselves, to test new identities, and to play. It's also about representation, and uh, we are talking about trying out of roles and models in a safe space. It is multifaceted, it is, has many different identities in a society on offer, but it's also a place for emotions, for empathy and compassion and laughter, and for relief when you go out and find out that you are actually were just playing a role and didn't die yourself. It is a stage for make-believe and imagination, and it gives you opportunity to travel time and space um, for those who play and for those who watch. But also, roles and frontiers are challenged and defined over and over again on a stage, and um, it is important to be able to playfully act and try out roles. Here I have a picture from my hotel room of a group of, uh, of young school children walking along the street, um, and they are 
obviously testing the role of being an adult by walking properly along the street in front of the big building of, I think it's a boys' school in, in front of the Ibis Hotel. Maybe you've recognized it, but it's fascinating what's going on there. And then lastly, a garden. And here I again put a photograph of the hotel. Uh, nature is everywhere. You have to interact without, with nature because you are nature, we are bodies. And even our very uh, modern and um, minimalistic hotel rooms have, 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 pi have a picture of nature, like these, these leaves of grass, which is of course a Walt Whitman quote. So in a garden, you experience yourself as a part of nature. It's a place for physical activity and you can adapt nature in a park, for example, as we see one here. A park is a city garden, which is used by many. It is maintained by civic authorities. It is a public good and it is a place, uh, a space for all. And it needs rules when you have many people people who use it. Um, it can be also a piece of nature with a fence around it. Heike will tell you that it can also be completely different. Um, it is a piece of nature with a fence around it or not. Um, it, is, it is a place where I actively feel myself and it, it, it can be understood as a shelter place and it doesn't have to mean I have to own it, but in our society it's, it often has to do with owning a place and calling it my own. And that was it from my side. Yeah. Well, the garden, the library, <laughs> yeah. and also the theatre, I think in Central Europe, we have through um, urban development and also through development in our society institutionalized these and um, quite interested over the last years but how can we actually rethink them as social practices which we are not doing in specific places but which we are can do in various places and also as, and also where we carefully have to think about how can we design educational spaces and um, and I've been thinking about that in the context um, of projects I've been doing in Iraq, and especially in Mosul. And um, Mosul became very famous in the last years because that was the place where the so-called Islamic State pronounced its capital in 2017. And I brought you a picture here of what the city is still looking like and what the city looked like as a result of um, the liberation wars. The city and also all educational institutions have been heavily destroyed. Um, more than 80% of the physical buildings have been destroyed and that, and Mosul as a city has been um, called home for more than two million people. So, um, liberation wars were quite, were heavy and ongoing over um, two years, um, ongoing over two years. So now we are dealing with a situation where basically everyone um, who is, um, who's been born in that place, who's been living in that place, are, is suffering from some kind of um, PTSD, either from displacement or by like physically experiencing these liberation wars. Um, ISIS did not fall from heaven, but um, for many, many years, um, since 2000, um, since 2000, um, you could see a rise in that part of Iraq of political extremism, where um, between 2007 and actually 2017, all cultural life was banned, all intellectual life was banned, People were publicly shamed for play, playing musical instruments. More than 300 intellectuals who've not fled the country have been publicly assassinated for speaking out. Yeah. So, and this is now left <laughs> um, people who are returning and who are trying to rebuild their lives there. Um, so, and to think about what does the garden and the library <laughs> And, um, and also what does the theater mean in that space and how can these shared social practices be meaningful for something? This is what I would like to be talking about. And I'm talking about different activities we've been running and doing and um, with, together with colleagues and young people at um, Mosul University. Um, at Mosul University. The university itself has been overtaken by the so-called Islamic State in between 2017 and actually run for a couple of years. 
people were forced to attend, and also some they wanted to, some they wanted to, and but as part of the liberation was also the campus itself. Um, buildings were destroyed. There were mines placed all over the all over the campus, and um, so. After the liberation, there was a strong push from the government for people to return. Reconstruction started. Now the university is physically reconstructed. But what we can see is all over the last 20 years, because there's been little academic activity, a very low degree of social interaction between people. The university did run in exile for 14,000 students, but in various, um, in various places, so little social interaction. Slow trust in institutions, young people not seeing a big of value of education and science, also as being as a result of indoctrination, um, and in a certain, um, yeah, and of course people represent different parts of society, so there's a lot of hostility, tension, and fears, and people coming back, and some of them having been victims of genocide, others maybe have been um, supporters, or the majority have just been silent. <laughs> yeah. And that's the situation, um, that's the situation we are talking about. So what are, um, so, so what are social practices um, in such a challenging post-war context? And I brought you three examples I wanted to, I wanted to talk about. These are pictures from Mosul University Library, how it looked in 2017 and 2018, um, um, just after the, just after the liberation. One of the, and if we talk about the library as a space, I've been seeing various social practices throughout my visits and also throughout the activities we did as part of the project. One of the earliest one maybe was the initiative of young students and lecturers from the university to rescue burned books. Yeah? And to go into a building that's still mined and to, to look for and to look for resources. Mosul University has been hosting a um, rich part of the cultural heritage, rich documents which are forever lost, documenting the, um, like the cultural richness of Mesopotamia. Millions of resources um, got burned, also a lot of them, a lot of them ser served. So young people getting together and rescuing what's there. Um, maybe as a type of a social practice. But they did not only do that, and the other picture that's showing here, they also digged out some of the traditional music instrument. This is a young musician from the city, Khaled, who's been practicing all throughout occupation next to a generator so that nobody would hear him. And he would play, and he plays historical music, which has been played in that region for over thousands um, of years. So young people organized a concert in that space, reclaiming back that, reclaiming back that space. The Mosul University Library has been completely reconstructed with money from the um, European Union. You can see those pictures there of the right. It was reopened two years ago, and now it's a place where these rescued resources are being restored where also reading, <laughs> again, is taking place, and it's one of the few quiet places you can actually have and work. But also now there's been various initiatives of book bridges and people donating their private libraries um, to that library to rebook, to restore the library or to rebook the library. And one of the interesting libraries they're hoping hosting is that one of Edmund de Waal, which was part of the British Museum, which is the Library of Exile. And through that, now also offering young people through reading to reconnect with other places in the world. And also the library has become a museum for remembering and some of the burn spot remaining um, as something to, something to remember. Another social practice or an example for a social practice if we are talking about um, the idea of theater is maybe the student conference we are organizing as part of our as part of our project, which the it's called Rethink Education and Science in Iraq. Yeah. And here we started in 2016 to bring together displaced students with displaced academics from various disciplines to start discussing and how what are their ideas for um, yeah, reconstructing and also reconciliation after ISIS? 
and we've been run over eight of these conferences with more than 4,000 young people and more than 1,000 academics participating, meeting for a week in interdisciplinary workshops, and thinking about what can academia and science offer for us to better understand our situations, and also what could be, um, what, what is it that we could meaningfully do to take action. Um, these are built on the principles of openness, interdisciplinarity, diversity and representation, and we ensure that at least 20% of the students who are participating are representing minorities who've been um, um, facing genocide. So these conferences have been, I think still there are, and there's been one of the early examples where we brought people together from different communities to start listening to each other again but to come together in playing roles, and that's the one of academics having, and future academics and future leaders, <laughs> yeah, having a responsibility for rebuilding society, negotiating different perspectives, and also having given the opportunity to, to act on stage. And for the majority of the participants, it's their first time of opportunity to be on stage as young people, as women. The picture I brought you here is a young Yazidi woman from Sinjar who's been opening our last conference and closing our last conference. So also they're reclaiming back the stage and claiming space, claiming space for them. So this could be a carefully designed social practice in that regard. As a result of the conference, we are um, also supporting young people to take action <laughs> and to form groups from the various communities. And what I brought you here is just a small example of what young people have been doing. This is a picture from Sinja Mountain. You see young people cleaning garbage. And to understand the importance of that picture, Sinja Mountain is located in the north of Iraq. That's the area where the Yazidi people have been living. It's still an area which is um, contested and weakly bombed by various um, forces. And Sinja Mountains has been the place where the Yazidi people found um, they have been fleeing to when ISIS overtook the area. So, but also has been for thousands of years a place of worship where Yazidi people went as part of their religion to connect with nature, which is important to their religion. People fleeing from the so-called Islamic State fled to the mountain and um, but and it also has turned into a graveyard for thousands of people starving there. So going to that mountain <laughs> is not just somebody caring for the environment. It has a variety of meaning, yeah, in caring for a place of worship, preserving, preserving that, reconnecting and um, belonging, having various kinds of, <laughs> having um, various kinds of feeling, yeah, yeah. And, but also to, and this has been important to the young people, to, to maintaining it and reclaiming it to be a part where they can feel, connect, relaxed, and also enjoy and, be, um, and feel being the part of nature. For me, what is important as talking about these, um, as these examples is that I believe when we talk about the radical idea of inclusiveness, that it's our responsibility to create spaces um, for people to have these meaningful consumatory experiences. Yeah. And I think in that it is very important, yeah. Um, that not just with that we care about accessibility and quality, but that also that we reconsider and that we allow for people having different objectives and when they engage as part of these part part of these experiences and that they are open to interpretation and redefinition. Um, or everyone who participated in our activities maybe joined for different purposes. Also learned um, learned different things and I think these practices they are showing and maybe how when there's no garden anymore, <laughs> and then there's no theater anymore, <laughs> and when there's no library anymore, we can still cultivate those practices for being part of hope <laughs> and also for rebuilding a society.
Which brings me to part five, the last slide, conclusions. Um, and I start from the bottom up, taking up what Heike just said. Inclusion means, um, means to accommodate everyone's needs and they can be much more diverse than we think. Than we, think. we know already, we might not know. And I learned a lot from, um, from our interaction on this, on this, on this uh, presentation, uh, how to rethink um, the, the shared social practices that we think are granted and uh, what it means to see them from, from a place where they are not shared anymore more because they are destroyed. And, and also it brings me to a very philosophical point, like we cannot rebuild uh, Mosul as it was, even with, with a lot of European money. Uh, but we can, um, what we can do is when, when, when a promise is broken that we gave each other in the, in this, in the, in the social contract, we can try to build a state, a new state, um, where, where we can try not to repeat what has happened already. Um, so this is may, maybe the future orientation of, of the project we are involved in. So, and humanism depends on humans. It, it is people who have to do it. And, uh, the the, and, and so the interventions in the public sphere start with individual actions. Um, we have to think outside the boxes and maybe um, we have to combine our thinking in order to, to achieve these things, in order to, to, to work with the narratives well known, like our, our, our buildings that we find in our, in our big European cities and even the smaller ones, a library, an opera or a theater and a park. I mean, you find that in all the central and mid-European and Western European state uh, cities. And um, I think what is really important is, and here you have this little picture on the side, this is from a, a wish tree that Heike built in a library um, three years ago. Um, in Mosul, um, where people could could write down what they were wishing for, um, what we need is we need creative methods, and 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 we need them because creative method act methods actually create and enable experience that are worthwhile. Thank you very much. For I think we have about five to ten minutes to, uh, to ask some questions. Uh, so if you would like to ask any questions to our speakers, please raise your hand and I'll run to you with the microphone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Barbara and Heike, for the amazing job you've been doing in Mosul in Iraq in a very difficult and precarious context. Uh, I would just, I, it's mind blowing really that you go there and done all these amazing things that you, you just uh, mentioned to us. I just, I'm just interested in, based on my understanding of context, what are some of the challenges you experience in the humanization of humanization? And, and, and it's really amazing how Heike can act as she does, because she must feel it even more. Well, I, I think the biggest challenge is how do you create um, um, social practices with people who do not have positive consummatory experiences on which to build on. Um, when we run these conferences once a year and we have more and we usually have places for 800 to 1000 students usually have more than 4000 students who are willing to come <laughs> in their holidays to the university and um, more than 800 prof uh, 80 professors who are willing to spend a week of their holidays with their students because they find what they are doing meaningful <laughs> and that in a context where you would you still have to rebuild your house, <laughs> yeah. And even when they, and even they did that when they came. So, I, and what they all say is that these experiences are somewhere they feel seen and where they feel acknowledged, and this is something they experience for the first time. Sadly, as that is, <laughs> sadly as that is, and but that also means that. Um, people bring a lot of negative experiences and suspicion 
to the different um, to the different situation, and people bring a lot of different types of traumas, um, and 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 to hold space for that, <laughs> yeah, and to work towards spaces being safer um, for people. That's a very difficult. Um, that's a very difficult one. It's becoming more challenging now. Um, as Iraq's getting more politicized, and um, between like in the recent in the recent conflict, where people again for the academic works they are having threats, receiving threats <laughs> um, from various and um, from various places, and how to do these things when safety is not guaranteed. I think this is the biggest challenge in that regard. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk, and I am fascinated by the very idea that you got there. Okay, so like how how so one question would be like how did you end up okay in Mosul, you know? So what is your trajectory to go there? That would be one question, uh, and the other would be more theoretically oriented. Be and I would just single out the meaning of the park and theater in northern Iraq. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, like how much did you have to learn and prepare before you entered the space? Because, I mean, I am not familiar with the I Iraqi part okay, of the world, but I do know what park means, for instance, in Turkey, yeah. which means very different, m many different things in comparison with the park here. And like also what theater would mean for them, especially for the women students there. Thank you. Maybe I maybe I start. I I worked at TU Dortmund University. They have a joint bachelor in regional planning with a university in North Iraq. And there I taught courses on um, quality development in 2012 and 2013. And in 2014, I was also there when um, ISIS occupied 40% of Iraq, and many of my students did not come and show up to university anymore. <laughs> and um, and that was something where we felt should be like where, if not then, to show solidarity. Then in 2014 and 15, Mosul University was taken over um, by ISIS. And then in 2015, it was reopened by the ministry in exile. And Mosul University did run um, programs, undergraduate programs, for more than 14,000 students in exile. And this is where we thought, what if not then, to <laughs> show academic solidarity. And we got funding from the German Academic Exchange Service to, um, to design a, a project. And at that point, it felt completely impossible to do some academic research in one area, <laughs> but rather it felt that um, we need to design something which is bringing people together from <laughs> various disciplines, from the whole university to discuss, and this is how we started. We, um, we always had a program specifically working with um, Yazidi students and survivors of genocide, um, but then um, a lot of people are doing that. <laughs> and I think I'm German, and as Germans we know that the question of um, rebuilding society is also one where we need to re-educate everyone and also the majority. <laughs> and this was, and this is what we are still um, working on. We are a steering committee. There are seven professors from Mosul University, plus me and a colleague from TU Dortmund University. So we are also in the minority, <laughs> like from a European perspective, from a European perspective, and we are carefully designing that. Um, I think the theoretical questions you are asking, and this is what we always find interesting to discuss, and this is what we've been starting here, is to um, to see what can be gardens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what can be gardens and what are different meanings of gardens. Yeah, And when Barbara start, ta started to talk about gardens in her philosophical approach, now I said, no, but for me, the Sinja mountain is a garden. <laughs> yeah, and it's been always used as a, <laughs> has been always used as a garden. And even though this is the picture of the 
public theater in Mosul at the bottom, even though there are no theaters anymore, but there are still various stages, <laughs> yeah, which become theaters, <laughs> which become which become theaters. So I find this idea still to think about where are stages, <laughs> yeah, where are stages in, in which people have, where we can hold a space in which people can perform different roles and also can be somebody again and can be seen, <laughs> can be seen and where young people can claim spaces again. In that then I felt okay, but then also the stage of the auditorium in the university where young women from the Christian and Yazidi community, they come back on stage and they say what they wish everyone to have to say and there's the governor there who listens <laughs> and the university president there um, to listen. This is what then is becoming a theater to a certain extent. This at least would be my understanding. And I think also on the theoretical level, I think this is what humanization of humanization can mean that we that we keep the old ideas of, of theater, library and garden, but we reinterpret them and we renegotiate them. And and, and it helps to also see like the broad concept is 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 underneath. Like I, I, I want to be alone with myself. I want to be able to study and I need a space to do this. And this should be guaranteed by the society I live in. And the same for being in nature and being with others and do things like, like, like educating ourselves in roles. And I mean, there's also the underlying uh, very humane thing, just sitting together, laughing together, crying together, sharing food braiding hair like like when we visited Heike's friends in the in, in a refugee camp we didn't speak the language and not everybody speaks English and so so we just sit down together and we talk and we look each other in the eye and we start braiding each other's hair which is a very sort of it's 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 um, there is Robin Kimmerer's idea of, of braiding in in um, in 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 um, uh, in in America before the Europeans came and and br it, that was a very very um, fundamental experience for me that there is a connection not just through empathy but through shared practices and some of them are are more institutionalized than others but you always you always also need to rely on that there is something humane like sharing food or a laughter or or, or a smile. Thank you very much. I think we close at this. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, the plan now is to uh, have a celebratory part and to do some celebrations with our International Sociological Association colleagues. And I would like to invite Professor Ashbarat Barat to the stage to introduce two important International Sociological Association awards. Perhaps uh, Dr. Stefali Kasilda could also join us. She was in the committee, uh, at the chapter of the award. And after that, there'll be some more awards and then we'll have a coffee break. So let's just stick to the plan and start with the Sociological Association Awards. So I give you the tool. Thanks for the tool. Okay. So actually, we are the honorary co-organizers co of the event. I mean, uh, RC25, which is language and society, as part of the International Sociologist Association. And I have been elected as chair of the award committee for RC25. And we uh, distribute, we select two uh, distinguished scholars okay, for these awards. And one of them is uh, for academic excellence, which is based on the past, usually with COVID it changed, but usually on the past two years of article publications in our journal, which is Language, Discourse and Society. And for that, uh, our uh, committee, and Stephanie as outgoing president of RC25 was uh, on that committee, so that's why we are standing here together. And uh, as for the um, uh, uh, 
article award or based on the article publication. Okay, that goes to Dr. Judith Crow. Okay, from the University of Arizona. Okay, and uh, more importantly, in a way, because that is the other award that is based on somebody's academic contribution for a long period of time that is literally for academic excellence and uh, that is based on nominations from members of RC25 and uh, I'm really happy to make the announcement that the Distinguished Career Award okay, uh, of RC25 ISA is uh, uh, to Salin Marie Pascal, who was our, I should say, founding chair of RC25. And I would like to ask Stephanie to say a few words on that one, because you took over from Salin. So thank you very much for this opportunity to jointly organize the, the conference. Thank you, Anna. And uh, also, uh, after the COVID time period and everything, uh, uh, it was important for us uh, to be able to recognize this as a award, I mean, in real life, <laughs> so, uh, uh, with an audience. And um, the, um, the Distinguished Career Award of uh, RC25 ISA is awarded every four years uh, during the year of the um, World uh, Congress. Um, and I'm extremely happy that the, <laughs> the committee member, uh, on the basis of the nomination, uh, granted Celie Marie Pascal this award uh, because she, um, uh, she, she was ab absolutely uh, important for RC25, but also for the field of language uh, and society as a whole. Uh, and notably, uh, she was the one uh, introducing to like a motto of RC25, uh, which is looking at language rather than solely through it, and which is extremely important on how we look at language and uh, it's also what is done uh, through the, the journal, Language, Discourse and Society. Uh, and uh, I'm really thankful to uh, Anna <laughs> uh, to be the editor-in-chief of Language, Discourse and Society. Yeah. Um, yes, and I am already enjoyed the presentation, the keynote of Céline Marie uh, just after this world, so thank you so much. And we hope that both of them are watching us online already, actually. So if you are, which we hope, okay, so congratulations. We have some more awards. And it's not a coincidence that you should stay here because two of them are for you. So this year, this year, we are celebrating 20th anniversary of the UNESCO chair at our institution. And um, our Senate of University decided to establish a special medal for achievements for human rights and uh, for people and institutions most involved with human rights, children's rights and education for peace and um, involved with SDGs, with the Sustainable Development Goals 4, 5 and 10. And I would like to announce that one of the awardees is Professor Dr. Ashbarat Barat uh, for supporting the implementation... <laughs> for supporting the implementation of the UN Sustainable Development Goals 4 and 5 and especially for relentless research activism in support of gender studies and women's and minority rights. And the second medal goes to Dr. Stephanie Casilde 
um, which is granted in recognition of supporting the implementation of the UN Sustainable Developmental Goals 4, 5 and 10 and especially for sociological intercultural dialogue and relentless support of migrants, refugees and people in crisis of homelessness in Belgium. So... <laughs> There's a medal for you, and there are certificates. This one's for you, and this one's for you. And we will have a pleasure of listening to your speech tomorrow morning. So I thank you for now. And I would like to invite two more very special guests today. Thank you. Who are from Poland. So they are second because we are hosts we are in Poland so I do apologize that you are second very distinguished professors from Poland um, first one professor doctor habilitowana Joanna Madalinska Michalak for <laughs> cultivating SDGs 4 5 and 10 and for long-term achievements uh, for the Academy of Young Researchers and the International Pedagogical Dialogue. Professor will have a keynote address later, but for now on, I would like my colleagues to help me a little bit with the flowers and I will hand over the medal. Thank you very much, Professor, for being here with us, and we are looking forward to your speech a little bit later on. And now last, but not least, our Professor, Dr. Habilitowana Ewa Kulesza. <laughs> from the Maria Grzegorzewska University for internationalization of Polish pedagogical thought and for spreading the mission of inclusion in uh, Far East countries, uh, Asia and Eastern Europe. Thank you so much for being here with us. Congratulations on behalf of the Senate of the Academy of the Maria Grzegorzewska University and the chapter of the awards. Thank you so much for being here with us and we are looking forward to your speech a little bit later on. Now we will have a little coffee break. We invite you for a break. And hello, hello, whilst you gather, and just a few practical announcements. Uh, we will now have four presentations. Then there will be a round table discussion and then we go to dinner in a different building. So do not despair. If someone gets lost, it's in Bar Filmowe, which is in building C. This is practical information. It's on the floor one of building C. Building C is the green glass building in the middle of our yard. Uh, <coughs> and um, uh, more practical announcements. Tomorrow we have some more colleagues joining us. Uh, we start at 9.30. The registration will be open from 9 o'clock. You're very welcome to come early because there'll be a coffee break that we start with tomorrow to keep us happy through the day. Okay, one more minute till we go back. I'm just waiting for 1600 hours so that our transmission link starts working. It does now. So, welcome back after the break. Thank you so much for being with us at the Maria Grzegorzewska University at the conference co organized with ISA RC25, with Polish Pedagogical Association, and most of all with Stockholm University and our amazing Dr. Jude Tah, who is still here with us. Thank you, Jude. 
Um, this is my ambition today to mention you a lot. But now we will um, move on to our keynote address by Professor Celine Marie Pascal, who was awarded the Distinguished Scholar Award today by the RC of ISA, RC25 International Sociological Association. She represents American University in Washington, D.C., and she'll be talking about conditions of unknowing adult language acquisition in times of trauma. Hello, Celine. Nice to see you. And I hello, would like Anna. Hello. And I would like to uh, leave the floor to you. So the floor is yours. We're listening attentively to your speech. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation to give a keynote presentation to this conference. I regret very much that I'm not with you in person. I've had the great privilege of belonging to the International Sociology Association's Research Committee on Language and Society since 2006. I'm really grateful to receive the Distinguished Scholar Award from the RC. Throughout my career, the RC has been a cornerstone of my intellectual community and a source of support for research on each of my four books, dozens of articles and book chapters. In the last 18 years, the research committee has featured original scholarship from around the globe and hosted nearly 36 conferences. It's challenging in the best of times to build geographically and intellectually diverse community. So it's even more impressive that our leadership has ensured that we survived in the face of a global pandemic. Stephanie Casild, KJ, KJ Fujiyoshi and the RC25 board deserve enormous thanks for their efforts. I also want to thank Jaja Bharat and the RC Awards Committee for their work and their generosity. Leadership, even this wonderful leadership, isn't possible without community. And so I want to offer a heartfelt gratitude to all of the scholars who have made RC25 possible. Also to congratulate Jaja and Stephanie on their much deserved UNESCO awards. And while I am acknowledging contributions, I want to congratulate Anna as well on celebrating her 20th anniversary as UNESCO chair. 20 years, Anna. It hardly seems possible, but that's the nature of life. Sometimes even wonderful things are hard to imagine. So I want to start um, by recognizing, I think it's important to recognize at every opportunity that we face a glo global climate crisis and myriad political catastrophes, all of which are going to feature prominently in the years ahead. Both as scholars and as teachers, I suspect that we are all sensitive to the tremendous instability inside and outside of academia that this creates. Indeed, we see the very notion of an inside and outside rapidly dissolving as governments around the globe exert their power over curriculum. This conference offers timely and much needed efforts to deepen social inclusion in curriculum, particularly for children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So I want to say at the outset that I have no expertise in this area whatsoever. Consequently, it's an odd situation to be asked to serve as a keynote speaker. So I will do my best to speak to issues of learning more generally with the aspiration that you will find something in this talk that's relevant to the important work that you are doing. Pedagogy is as much cultural as it is disciplinary. Around the globe, much of education is based on top-down models in which human relationships are irrelevant. One simply teaches a subject or a text to a classroom. This approach has had very limited success for me as a student and as an educator. Pedagogically, I value the feminist liber liberatory capacity of education that supports personal and collective transformation, not just information acquisition. My early experience with liberatory pedagogy taught me that intimacy, vulnerability, and trust are the foundations of effective learning. 
Even so, I learn to teach as if I could know things about my students, and sometimes I did. Sometimes I was familiar with personal stories that they shared during office hours. I knew their strengths and weaknesses as learners, sometimes their hopes and fears as individuals. The belief that we know something about our students is itself an expression of authority that guides our educational efforts. But honestly, I don't know how much we can ever really know about another person. But if this sounds like I'm having an existential crisis, I want us to invite you to step back from that narrative and take up the invitation to explore conditions of unknowing. The phrase doesn't refer to ignorance or unlearning, but rather to being fully alive to the present moment. No narratives, no explanations, no authoritative knowledge. Conditions of unknowing refers to, excuse me, and Jerry, in an intersubjective relationship with openness, vulnerability, and curiosity. So I want to offer you a concrete example of something that might be relevant to the work that you're doing. For the last seven months, I have volunteered at a local literacy center that serves youth who need to complete high school degrees and increasing numbers of refugees displaced by violence in Haiti and Ukraine. I received a standard training, workbooks and readings from the center, and as is typical for immersive language learning, I entered the learning experience without a common language. Yet refugees are learners with more than linguistic and cultural differences. In the case of Ukrainian and Haitian refugees, they are people fleeing war zones. So I have been tutoring a Ukrainian refugee who fled the Russian assault. So please allow me to refer to her for the purposes of this talk as Nadia. She's an older woman who had been in the US for about a year when we met. Before I began to work with Nadia, I was told that she had limited success with English. And that was certainly true. I was told that she didn't spend enough time around English speakers and that she just didn't try hard enough. For the first two months, we practiced with materials provided by the Literacy Center. The workbooks offered standard repetitive exercises for standard language learners. For example, the room is blue. What color is the room? The room is blue. Is the room red? No, the room is blue. Nadia had success with the exercises. She learned all of the basic vocabulary, yet this never seemed to contribute to actual language use. I wondered if her lack of progress was related to her hope that her time in the US was just a temporary displacement. To build a relationship, I asked Nadia to show me family photos on her phone. Among the photos, there were maybe 50 that included her husband. In some, he is with family. In others, he's holding a huge fish that he caught. In others, he's celebrating a birthday or holding grandchildren. His expression in all of the photos is always the same. He's very stern. He doesn't smile in a single photo. This observation forced me to reconsider Nadia's slow progress, particularly her unwillingness to speak. I wondered, am I looking at an abusive relationship? Am I seeing cultural differences? Is this wartime trauma? I had no idea. And without a common language or experience, I had no way to find out. And it was in this moment that I was alive to the condition of unknowing. I stopped trying to teach her English. I set all of the workbooks aside and began to offer her tools to tell her story. We began to practice conjugating regular verbs and building vocabulary based on readings that were of interest to her. 
Then I asked her to use the verbs and vocabulary to write sentences in various tenses. Her first, for her first assignment, she wrote, on February 24th, a bomb fell by my house. We were very fear. My daughter could not stop cry. This moment changed everything. Nadia began to write about her personal experience. I taught her grammar based on what she was writing. From there, she practiced speaking at first, just reading scripts that we had generated. After five months, when she was tested by the center, she had progressed through four levels of language acquisition. This was an amazing success for both of us. Being present to the conditions of unknowing, accepting that I didn't know, could not know, refocused me from teaching language to empowering self-expression. To be alive to conditions of unknowing means entering into a relationship in which we acknowledge that we don't know what's happening. It means being present with the discomfort of that reality. And it means relinquishing the authority of teaching to adopt a posture of openness that enables curiosity. In this context, the question of what's going on can't be answered by the teacher alone. Learning becomes intersubjective in which the student guides their own path of mastery. Being open to and present with conditions of unknowing has made it possible for me to create a transformative and empowering learning environment for Nadia and for me. So perhaps it could do the same for you and your students. Jen Kuya. Okay, super. Thank you so much. That was a very powerful speech on inclusion through language acquisition. And it is very apt at the moment as we have some visitors from Ukraine at our university who will be joining us at tomorrow's sessions. So thank you so much for this, Celine Marie, and for connecting with us early in the morning in your time zone. We do appreciate this. And uh, please uh, stay with us if you wish, uh, or just uh, follow us on the YouTube link. Um, on the shared link that we uh, gave you. Now, I'd like to invite Professor Madalinska Mihalak, Joanna Madalinska Mihalak, to the forefront of our discussion. And she will present from a PowerPoint. I'm just going to um, open one moment somewhere here. Just need to change the um, screen because I don't know how to do this. Oh yeah, it's closed now. Uh, this will be this one. No, not this one. This one. Sorry. Perfect. No, this one. Uh, moment. Not this one. Sorry. Okay, that's me. I'm done. Sorry to keep you waiting. Okay, so uh, Professor Janna Madalinska Mihalak is a very famous personality in Poland, an honorary uh, patron of many events, uh, a famous professor. So we are very humbled and honored uh, with this collaboration, and uh, thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Anna, for the invitation. Uh, I will try to short my presentation as my colleague mm, from United States mm, uh, did, but I couldn't promise. So uh, what I would like to uh, talk about today, it will be about the inclusion and how the collaborative uh, works can help to empowering inclusion mm, education. And uh, because... Uh, most of you, I assume, are not from Poland. I thought that it might be useful for you uh, to share with you some facts about Poland as a country and especially the situation of children in Poland. So as you know, Poland, it is the country that um, the population is uh, more than 
37 million. And what we see regarding our demography that um, the population is aging. Because, uh, for example, if you will look at this data, you see that within 10 years, uh, the percentage of children in Poland uh, decrease uh, around three uh, percentage. It is, I think, a lot. And as far as the as children with the special education um, needs are concerned, our statistics shows that uh, we have uh, around four point um, four point one percentage of these students at our uh, school. Um, so it is still a lot, and we have a lot to um, work to support them. Uh, in Poland, uh, we have the country research on the mental health of our population, and uh, is it uh, prepared by um, National Institute of Public um, Public Health? And uh, what we can learn from this research that, as far as uh, the youngest children are concerned, uh, we um, can find that. Uh, that um, at least, let me say, uh, two most common uh, problems with uh, the children, which is uh, visible in two dimensions, emotional and affective uh, disorder, which is observed in over 6% of our uh, children, uh, children up to six year old, and adaptive disorders, social communication disorder, or disorder and disorders in interacting with others, which affects um, over 4% of uh, children. And uh, as far as uh, the, um, let me say, elder children are concerned, from this report we can learn that the disorder are found in approximately 16% of children, which is, I think, a lot. And in this report, we uh, see that now new, let me say, mental um, problems, uh, they emerge, and there are different uh, um, factors that influence on them. And what we can learn from uh, this report also, that the um, factors that influence on these uh, different kind of disorders, and among the factors, uh, the researchers, they note is that the place of uh, living is uh, one of the most uh, influential factor because children in a rural area, where in Poland we have the, let me say, less support that in the cities, they suffer more often uh, regarding these um, disorders. And uh, as you know, when we look at the education, usually we refer to OECD study, this international PISA study, 2022, uh, not only in Poland, but I think that uh, across the world it was an educational shock connected with uh, time of uh, probably time post-COVID. And uh, we noticed that uh, Poland as a country, um, Poland as a country should know that at the beginning of 2000 we were a kind of the failure, but then we were among the um, achievers because we were in the top, uh, at the top of the list of OECD. Uh, and 2022 we noticed a huge drop in our um, children educational achievements in all the, uh, let me say, areas that are uh, concern, and uh, still, if we will look at the, the tables, we will notice that we are at the top, but it is not among the ten the best, let me say, countries. We are among. Uh, we have now the position around 17, 18. It depends on the area that it is uh, concerned. So. Uh, mm, what we can learn from this OECD report, um, the, um, let me say that people who try to analyze this report, they notice that in the center of our consideration, we should put not only these educational achievements, but we should put teachers, and uh, we should think 
how we can support teachers because teachers, as we learn from COVID time, uh, they, are, they were like the key ingredients in the students' uh, success. And uh, the another finding is that teacher education continues to play a key role in transforming education. And um, as you know, teacher education nowadays is uh, understood very broadly because we don't only think about the teacher trainings that we have usually at the universities, but we think about the teacher education like a lifelong learning process. So uh, we uh, try to think, take into account also socialization into the profession, uh, then the teacher education at the university, and then the teacher professional development. And. Uh, I would like to share with you also some very interesting findings uh, because uh, these, I think, um, are mo the most important ones. As far as we, we look at the student's sense of belonging at the school and satisfaction with life, we can notice that Polish students relatively, they have rather, let me say, low perception of belonging to the school and they are not so much happy with, the, with their life. Uh, and uh, you can notice that uh, student satisfaction with life more generally decline in uh, many countries, but in Poland, uh, let me say that each fifth student say that it's not satisfied with the life. So mm, there is the question about the future of these students. Mm, when we will look at the features that uh, visualize these findings, you can see the um, statistic. As you know, uh, 2000, uh, mm, two years ago, we had a very, mm, let me say, difficult time. Anna, as a vice rector of this uh, mm, university, she personally supported a lot of uh, children, families from Ukraine, because this academy is situated so close to the uh, West train station and uh, mm, refugees let me say in this way, people who migrate from Ukraine to Poland may, mainly, they, uh, the first, let me say, stop was at this West um, train station. And uh, we observed that our society has changed a lot because the society in the past was very coherent. We have uh, rather, we have had rather small, uh, mm, let me say, mm, small number of people from different uh, backgrounds. And nowadays, nowadays Poland has changed and uh, the group of uh, students from Ukraine uh, is a huge. And uh, regarding the um, mental health in Poland, UNICEF decided to um, take the study and directly contact with the uh, Ukraine children and the research was very interesting because they use uh, photos and they try to um, children to make reflections on the um, different pictures and they started to talk about their life in Poland and the report has a very significant title the title is like here undoubtedly it is cool here but a true home is once on home and uh, I really recommend this report because it shows us the mm, feelings of these children, how they uh, perceive their lives in Poland. And as you know, these children, they are mm, the students at the Polish school. So when we talk about the mental health, when we talk about the social inclusion, we should pay attention to this group of the students. and. Uh, from the report, we can learn that children from Ukraine, they express feelings of longing for people, pets, for uh, the places that they left in their home country. Uh, some children, they became apathetic and they um, have 
the problem with the, let me say, the proper, proper functioning. They have the tendencies to sleep longer than they should, and they felt, they feel that they are overwhelmed by the stress. And uh, over half of the students, mm, they said that uh, they would like to talk to the professional about their mental health. And uh, mm, in Poland, it was a few years ago when we introduced the Polish, how to say Polish what? Polish order, and the specific program by our previous government, we noticed how much the professional, professional support for children and young uh, people is important. And uh, mm, probably you know that last year we have uh, had the election and we have the new government. What is interesting about the new government, they started to look at the teachers at the school and at children and young people, and they put into the center, they, uh, let me say, well-being. And mental health is uh, very crucial nowadays for our uh, politicians, and they said that we have to support as much as possible uh, mm, this group of, uh, of people because the future is uh, connected with them. And it was the last day of... Uh, February, 29th of February, when we had the huge conference, uh, which was organized by, by the National Institute of uh, Research Education and the Ministry of um, Education, and uh, um, the program which is called, uh, which is called Supporting Education Access Accessibility for Children and Youth was introduced. However, this accessibility doesn't mean that it's only about the access to the education, but it is about the quality of uh, education. And uh, during this conference, uh, what uh, was interesting, especially for me, because I look sometimes very select selectively, and uh, my research area are teachers and teacher education, but I was really happy that uh, the mm, people who gather at this conference, they noticed that if we really would like to make any changes in our education, we should first of all uh, take care of our teachers. Poland as a country now is a completely different country than we had even 10 years ago. Never we have experienced the shortage of teachers, and now we have a lot of problem with that in a very short time, because it was 2019 when, firstly, we noticed that our teachers, they were uh, really unsatisfied with the working conditions, and they decided to go uh, on the strike. And this teacher strikes has changed a lot among the teachers at the school regarding the school atmosphere and so on. And the previous government even didn't want to talk to the teacher union. So one of the first, let me say, um, actions of this new government was to focus on the teachers, which is for sure very positive, uh, mm, very positive sign. And uh, this conference show, uh, let me say, show us some recommendations what is important uh, to do when we try to, uh, when we try to think about the um, proper quality education at the school. And as you see, we have uh, such recommendations like the development of students' emotional and social competences, uh, building a school community with a focus of, on a sense of community and belonging, uh, ensuring a good relationship at the school, uh, support for specialist teachers, in providing them with the methodological and uh, practical guidance, um, and so on. And uh, in this, let me say, because of the restriction of uh, time, uh, in this way I try to present you a little bit about the Poland and the situation, let me say, the conditions that um, have influence on, uh, on the issue of social inclusion and the mental health of children. So let us uh, move to the end um, of, uh, of this presentation, and I um, will try to pay attention to some, uh, let me say, uh, mm, directions as far as the mm, future is concerned. So uh, for sure what we see 
currently is this broad concern about children and young people's well-being in Poland. Uh, this is the situation that we have, and this situation is connected with the reality in which we are now. Uh, then um, we see that in Poland is important regarding research, uh, greater, greater access to early childhood education and care, especially at the rural area. Uh, Poland, it was like 20 years ago, uh, we were one of the, let me say, um, lowest uh, lowest rate of uh, entrance to the early childhood education and care in Europe. We, mm, after us, it was La Albania. We have done a lot. We introduced a lot of uh, different forms of early mm, childhood education and care, dif different forms, but still we see that, especially as I mentioned, the rural area, it's a lot to do. And, uh, <laughs> When we try to think about the future, I think that uh, um, we can um, we can identify a lot of interesting policy trends which are connected with this initiative to support health and well-being. And as I mentioned, teachers they play a fundamental role in education process. Uh, and um, I was happy that the last year after, let me say, long time, because two years we work on the special issue for European Journal of Teacher Education. And this uh, special issue uh, is about the, it's, um, it's about the um, teachers and uh, with uh, Professor Maria Flores and Professor Lynn Goodwin from uh, Hong Kong, now, now from United States, we prepared the chapter about the teacher education and in our chapter we try to look like from the above what happens now within the teacher education of course uh, not only in our countries but across the world and uh, we propose some main themes in our chapters that can be helpful for the researchers to analyze teacher education and uh, one of the issues, one theme, is about the teacher learning, efficacy, and well-being. I mentioned how much well-being of children is important and youngsters. Nevertheless, if we will not take care of teachers' well-being, it's hard to demand from the teachers that they will, will be really um, effective, uh, successful in their work. And uh, the research, when we talk about this teacher learning efficacy and well-being, uh, about the expectations of teachers, attraction of the teaching profession, emphasizes, emphasizes on professional development, and investment in teacher education. Uh, and uh, if we will make the assumption that teachers they play a central role in creating inclusive uh, learning environment where all students, including those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, they feel valued and supported, we should mm, try to create the conditions for this situation that must happen, I would say. And uh, from my point of view, teachers, they should serve as the facilitators of learning. They should be like the advocates for student needs and uh, they should play role models for uh, inclusive behaviors because we are talking about the inclusive education at the school and sometimes we don't think how teachers behave at the daily, let me say, life at the school. So the teacher education, which is directly connected with the, let me say, with the support for teachers, how to work on the social inclusion at the school is, uh, I think, um, a priority nowadays. And um, I would like to uh, pay your attention to this last, let me say, statement, that observation that is important personally for me, because I, from my point of view, the importance of collaborative efforts in creating uh, inclusive learning environments for children and young people with intellectual and developmental uh, disabilities is like the uh, priority for the schools, especially in Poland nowadays. So this social inclusion at the school, I, 
would see like a collaborative efforts and we can say about the inclusive school. So mm, the issues that I tackle mm, during my presentation, mm, just a short summary, they were about the context of education in Poland, the context that influence on the uh, situation of children. I try to match this context with the situation regarding the international report on education and especially the, um, the situation connected with the children's uh, well-being. And then I direct your attention to the policy that happens currently in Poland. And then a few words about the looking into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm just going to change the presentation. I've been informed that my window is showing as well unnecessarily. Let's have a look. So our next presenter um, will be uh, Professor Eva Kulesza, who is our distinguished professor and a director of Institute of Special Education. So I'm very happy that uh, we can host Professor Kulesza at our conference as an expert and a long, long lifelong um, supporter of inclusion. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I like to say thank you for such uh, uh, valuable and uh, um, splendid uh, um, uh, medal of Cathedra UNESCO. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, from the very beginning of my education, training, and early stages of my academic uh, career, uh, I was supported by, uh, by others. Uh, so I would like to share my knowledge, uh, international experience with the students, PhD, PhD students, and uh, young uh, scientists from uh, especially from Eastern Europe, from uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, uh, Japan, and uh, uh, Taiwan. Uh, so thank you very much. And today uh, also we have 12 students from Kazakhstan, from uh, Women National Pedagogical University, and they uh, uh, came here and they learned, I hope, uh, a lot from this conference. Uh, so uh, let me start my presentation and uh, I will uh, I will see it and uh, uh, I prepare also <laughs> I, I, I was doing this presentation in, in the early morning today, so, uh, uh, okay. Uh, so I like to uh, uh, say about the, the milestones in the perception of people with intellectual uh, disabilities in Poland. And my presentation uh, consists from two parts. And... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. try to move the presentation. Okay, how can I do it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, okay, thanks Thanks a lot. And first part uh, mm, uh, is a, a brief overview of the most important uh, pieces of legis legislation that relate uh, to the education of uh, pupils with special needs, including, of course, intellectual uh, disabilities, students with intellectual uh, disabilities. Uh, I will draw attention um, to the most important changes uh, in access to education, resulting uh, in the inclusion of students uh, uh, in the mainstream education. And the second part, uh, is my reflection on the changes in the perception of people with intellectual disabilities over the last century uh, since Poland gained independence after 123 years uh, of uh, partitions uh, and uh, uh, start to rebuild and build system of education. <coughs> 
And the, the first, the most important piece of legislation is the Constitution of 1921. And this act gave the right to education to all students without exception. Uh, it can, <laughs> therefore, uh, it can be sa said that in the beginning, education had uh, an inclusive, uh, inclusive dimension. Uh, however, uh, the school system was uh, in disrepair uh, at that time, in the beginning of the 20th century, and children with special needs uh, were most often out of the school due to the uh, lack of educational facilities. Uh, even uh, if such children were admitted to school, the teachers didn't know how to teach them. Uh, this problem was recognized and the easiest way, uh, the solution was to uh, take these children out of the system. And uh, however, uh, uh, Mm, and it, it's very important to say that uh, mm, uh, in the 90s of uh, 20th century, uh, intensive training of teachers to work with children with disabilities began. Uh, and important role mm, uh, was played by Maria Grzegorzewska, uh, patron of our university. Uh, and she uh, became the head of the Academy of Special Education in 1922, and she headed uh, the Academy until 1967. Uh, by 1939, it means uh, up to the Second World War, there were over 120 special education educational schools for children with disabilities, including about 90 special education, education uh, special schools uh, funded by Maria Grzegorzewska. Uh, the system of special education developed intensively throughout almost the uh, entire 20th uh, century. And uh, significant changes in the system uh, didn't place until the 90s of the 20th century. Uh, breakthrough is a directive uh, uh, 90, uh, ni uh, 29 uh, in 1993. Uh, and this directive uh, Thanks to this directive, uh, uh, special education system is merged uh, with the mainstream system. Uh, and this uh, directive uh, provides uh, mm, uh, for care and education of children with disabilities in general mainstream and integrated uh, centers. Mm -hmm. uh, significant uh, changes uh, happen uh, thanks to the uh, uh, education, uh, education law which was acted in 2010 and this educational, uh, educational law uh, regulated uh, psycho and, and uh, mm, uh, mm, obligated uh, every kindergarten and school to support children with children with uh, special needs uh, support with uh, psychological and pedagogical uh, support uh, and uh, uh, this law was uh, changed uh, in the following years 2013, 2017, to 2022. And uh, uh, in this, uh, this law uh, distinguished 12 groups of uh, uh, children, 
students with special education, uh, educational needs. Among them is, of course, uh, children with disabilities. Uh, and you can see this is the children with disabilities, socially maladjusted uh, uh, students, uh, students at risk of social maladjustment, students with behavioral or emotional disorders, gifted and talented students, students with specific learning difficulties, uh, um, uh, students with language communication disorders, uh, with chronic disease, uh, in crisis or traumatic situation, experiencing, uh, experiencing academic failures, experiencing in, in environmental neglect, neglect, neglect connected with the living uh, conditions uh, and experiencing uh, adaptation difficulties related uh, to cultural differences or to changes of educational settings. And also, uh, um, this is law, uh, um, law acted in, in 2010, regulates education for children and youths in three type, types of pla placement and introduce individual educational therapeutic programs and uh, plan for um, support development. And uh, uh, children and youth with disability can learn in three types of preschools and schools. And the first is uh, mainstream, of course, education. And uh, uh, now uh, in every mainstream kindergarten school can be uh, obligatory, obligatory can, uh, they, uh, they have, can, can be special educator. And uh, second type of placement is very unique, uh, I think, Polish solution. This is integrative uh, kindergartens and schools, and uh, the proportion of children are such three children with special educational needs to five children, to five children with typical development. And also, uh, the third one is special preschools and special schools. And number of children depends on, dis on disability, two to 16 children. And uh, mm, uh, irrespective of educational setting, special integrative or mainstream preschools, schools, uh, mm, uh, uh, the development of uh, uh, individualized education and, education and therapy program for children with statements of disability is required by the law. Uh, now I think it's very interesting indicators of uh, inclusion uh, according to the data taken from Central uh, Statistical Office 2023. Uh, in the 2023 school year, the major majority of children with disabilities attended mainstream kindergartens. It's, it, it, the indicator is 78%, including kindergartens with integrate, integration groups and integration kindergartens. And uh, uh, on the level of basic education, I mean, this is the um, basic schools with, uh, I'm sorry, with eight grades, not six grades. It's what before, uh, six grades, six classes, eight grades. Uh, um, uh, the indicator of in, uh, inclusion is 76.6% uh, percentage. And uh, mm, the picture is quite different when we talk about the education of young people with special educational needs at the secondary school level, uh, because uh, mm, mm, these uh, 
children, students uh, uh, were uh, enrolled in special schools. Uh, I try to compare the indicator uh, of inclusion in this, on this level, I mean the secondary level of, of education, and the data from 2014, and uh, I compare with the data 2033, the, the, uh, in the uh, indicator is about 15% student including included in mainstream education and this level of training. And finally, uh, second part. So this is my just observation and thinking, uh, and I distinguish uh, changes in the approach to people with intellectual disability over the last century, and uh, I just divided them in three parts in the comprehension of the essence of disability. Spe especially I, mm, I just uh, uh, thought about the intellectual disability and second in the attitude to persons with disabilities and the third area of changes in the perception of uh, uh, mm, the developmental potential of uh, of people with intellectual disability and the and the chance to live with dignity uh, so uh, uh, first uh, part first area first aspects uh, mm, this is the attitudes towards people people with disabilities. So this is uh, mm, from treating uh, people with disability, uh, uh, with intellectual disabilities, uh, object to subjectivity, uh, from focusing on impairments to searching uh, for strengths, from participating, uh, mm, part, mm, partic partic I'm sorry, from practicing different different function to reinforcing mechanism of self-rehabilitation, uh, from searching limitation in the functioning uh, of people with disability in the environment to removing uh, barriers and difficulties which, which they uh, can encounter in the environment. And changes in the comprehension of the essence of disability from a static category, I mean static category, uh, intellectual disability as a static category to a dynamic category of disability. From regarding intellectual disability as a, a feature to regarding it uh, as a condition which can change. From intellectual disability permanently attributed to the person to a uh, chance to get uh, beyond disability. Uh, from a single factor etiology to multi factor etiology, from general, uh, generalized uh, judgments of difficulties in solving problems to the difficulties experienced by a person in a given situation and in a given moment. And uh, Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, um, changes in rehabilitation of education of persons with disability. Uh, also, we can observe just uh, such kind of direction from education of compensating uh, for defects, deficits to humanistic education, humanistic approach from looking for diversi uh, diversity, diversifying features to perceiving common features, from segregated education away from the place of residence to inclusive education uh, in the place of uh, residence, from education uh, outside the family uh, to education in the family and practicing for ind independent life, 
from action oriented at uh, individual to family therapy, from actions oriented at a student and young adult to therapy and education for a person from their birth to old age, and uh, from being socially useful to independence and fulfillment of one's own life goals. So there are three mm, mm, uh, mm, areas of changes which, uh, which I uh, defined uh, and uh, of course all changes uh, influences of uh, system of education. Thank you. First, uh, foreign language is Russian, <laughs> so, and I talk with my uh, students uh, from Kazakhstan uh, in Russian, and the second is English, and the third uh, Spanish. So, uh, and I, I, I don't practice English for many times, so please, uh, I, I hope that you understand uh, what I uh, say, uh, what I said, uh, and if you have uh, any question, I just open to answer for them. Well, we are very grateful, Professor, that you have uh, provided a speech in English because the conference uh, is in English, so thank you for the special effort and thank you for being here with us. Before we connect with our next speaker, uh, we have an announcement to make. Um, our colleague from Oslo Met, Rolf Magnus Grun, turned 10 years older. <laughs> so. Uh, and we want to wish him a very happy birthday from the team of the Removal Barriers to Social Inclusion. <laughs> yes, uh, happy birthday, Rolf, that's for you. Obviously, we all love you. It's just a symbolic gesture to Thank celebrate you. you. That was very kind. And that you, you survived, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just, 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 just for Rolf. Just for all of you. To you, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rolf. Happy birthday to you. That was very, very surprising. I didn't expect a cake. Uh, I told Jude that I'm. Uh, I turned uh, 50 or four. It's a Actually, tomorrow it's uh, three weeks ago, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, turning 50 is great. So <laughs> you have to look forward to it. Uh, but thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes, one moment. I just need to connect. We go. Uh, here we are. I think our colleague is here with us. Let me see. Okay. Am I not logged in? For you. It's just for you. You know. We. You know. Just for you. This is the first time I'm drinking. Not been at work. <laughs> Super. Thank you so much. Okay. Very good. Okay, I think I think we're almost ready. I don't know if uh, Judith Crew is with us. We have two more minutes till uh, we go live with this presentation. Uh, Judith Crew is also from American University and could not join us today in person. I don't know how to check if she is... Okay, let's see, maybe I like this. Mm -hmm. Can we just check, Judith, if you can hear us? Oh, I think... Can you hear yes, us? Yes, I can. I, I, I can now. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you and see you. You're on a big screen, so you can later revise your presentation on the YouTube link. Oh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so let, me, no let me share. <laughs> Do you want um, to share oh. your presentation? 
Yeah, so it's a, uh, yeah. Okay, so I I'm going to put you in charge of that. Okay. 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 Awesome. Super. Well, thank you for being here with us. And we are very much looking forward to listening to your uh, presentation on reimagining the ordinary social inclusion through semiotics. And uh, congratulations on your RC25 ISA award and on an excellent article that we recommend for everyone to read on the website of Language, Discourse and Society Journal published by ISA RC25. So over to you, the floor is yours. Please uh, let us know what you prepared for us. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for uh, this lovely award. It was really quite unexpected. And thank you also everyone for taking time to listen to this um, virtual presentation. I wish that I could be there in person. Um, so today I, I just uh, want to give a brief kind of, I suppose not exactly a research talk as such, but more of a provocation for thinking about how we can support social inclusion of children and young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities by reimagining what, what the ordinary itself means. Now, I have to be honest, I don't actually do research on young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but I do work with young people who are marginalized in other ways, socioeconomically, um, in terms of their gender expression, um, in terms of the locale in which they live. Um, I work in Japan, uh, particularly now in rural Japan. So the young people that I'm working with are not marginalized um, because they have particular disabilities, but rather because they're um, peripheralized from core social practices in Japanese life. And so I want to use this talk really to just think through what the ordinary itself means and how we can do research in ways that contributes to the reimagination of ordinariness itself. So it's important to keep in mind how much of what counts as ordinary is negotiated. So many, much research has shown that ordinariness functions as a mediator, which is to say it's a way of thinking through different kind of life ways. Certain life ways are deemed to be ordinary and certain life ways are deemed to be not ordinary. They can be extraordinary, so they're seen as somehow superlative with respect to a norm. They can seem, um, they can be deemed as not ordinary though negatively, as though there was an ordinary life way and someone has failed to live up to that standard. Um, and because ordinariness is a mediator, it's a mediator that has to be negotiated. And um, so I uh, do research more on the language side of social life, so it can be negotiated in interactions as a form of semiosis, which is to say it's negotiated at the level in small moments of speech, in small moments of practice, where it functions as a way to make social meaning. Ordinariness is also a complex network. And by complex network, I mean here that it's a complex of alignments, of negotiations, and of politicizations, because what counts as ordinary is often a political question. That is to say, ordinary for whom, ordinary in what way, ordinary with respect to what kind of standard. And as a political, negotiated, complex um, social aspects of life, ordinariness is always fluctuating and unstable. And it seems to me that we can capitalize particularly on this last um, aspect of ordinariness to think through how determining what counts as ordinary is a kind of micropolitics. It's a micropolitics that individuals in the communities that we study engage in. And it's also the kind of micropolitics that we as researchers can also think about because we are attending to certain aspects of social life. So the importance of attending to the ordinary is reflected in the fact that the ordinary is the site of negotiation, as I uh, briefly discussed, but it's often treated as invisible, right? So many people have pointed out that the part of the power of ordinariness is the fact that it doesn't have to prove itself, right? 
It doesn't have to stand out. It doesn't have to stand alone. Um, and what I want to think through a little bit more from now is how turning to the ordinary, how labeling something as ordinary, and how in some cases aspiring to the ordinary can be a form of endurance and resilience. That is to say, in the uh, research that I do, for example, the younger adults that I look at, again, younger adults who are marginalized in different ways than those um, with uh, developmental or intellectual disabilities, but those who are nonetheless marginalized as a result of socioeconomic facts or other social facts, they turn to an aspirational ordinariness as a way to get through the difficulties of daily life. And in that regard, the ordinariness functions for them as a tactical tool for indirectly resisting hegemonic imperatives. What this means is that for many individuals to label something as ordinary is a way of resisting what counts as ordinary in a hegemonic sense. That is to say, I make something ordinary by appealing to ordinariness as part of my um, form of life, my, my life way, the, play, the embodiment that I have in the world. And in that sense, I am subtly transforming the meaning of ordinariness itself and doing some kind of political work. So a lot of researchers have looked at the way in which um, ordinariness is linked to transformation and to endurance. The two that I would um, perhaps call attention to are Vina Das, who has looked at the ordinary as transformative. Vina Das's research is focused on um, communities in India, post-partition communities um, that suffered significant amounts of violence during partition. And um, in that sense, what Das is looking to is what happens after ordinariness is lost, right? How do we get back to a state of ordinariness? And for Das, this means the birthing of an eventual everyday from the actual everyday. So for Bina Das, ordinariness functions as a kind of prefiguration. I look to a new form of ordinariness that is not necessarily part of my actual everyday ordinariness. For Elizabeth Povinelli, who's done a lot of research with um, native communities, um, indigenous communities in Northern territories of Australia, ordinariness functions as endurance. So um, Elizabeth writes, rather than trying to become otherwise, which is to say, rather than trying to grow or to be more than what we are now, we are trying to be the same and this is enough for us. So here, ordinariness is understood as the continuation of what we have now, that the endurance of the everyday into the future functions as its own form of achievement. And it's important to keep in mind that these are not contradictory. Endurance can become a form of transformation because it changes the terms of the debate of what counts as a good or desirable life. If the continuation of today functions as a form of desirable life, we're actually pushing back against a whole host of hegemonic pressures towards growth, towards change, you know, capitalist pressures, imaginations, um, perhaps for uh, those of you who are more closely involved with younger adults in terms of their social exclusion, thinking about what it means to develop right? What do, what, what do we describe as a developmental disability? What does it mean to develop at all? What, does, what are the standards through which we imagine um, intellectual growth? Why is growth seen as so central to this imagination of a successful life? Um, and because I do research in language, I'm going to be primarily looking at things um, in their linguistic aspects. So Harvey Sachs has argued that ordinariness is what one does to show that one is ordinary. So in a sense, one can make oneself ordinary by doing ordinariness. Ordinariness is not necessarily a state, it's a practice that has to be continually engaged in. It has to be repeated. It is a performance in that regard. Um, at the same time, and again, with respect to language, the appeal to ordinariness so, for example, to label something ordinary in language can be a form of negotiation of challenging life circumstances. So Yoshiko Matsumoto has uh, 
coined this um, term quotidian frame to describe how older individuals who are facing really severe um, traumas related to the death of a spouse or to the loss of mobility often reframe how they're describing these quite challenging circumstances in terms of ordinary aspects of life. So one of the examples that Matsumoto often gives is an older woman describing the death of her husband as though he were taking a nap and then adding on, oh, you know, he was always the kind of person to just be falling asleep at every opportunity, right? So reframing something that was quite traumatic as something that occurred within the confines of an ordinary life. And in that sense, doing um, a kind of work to reimagine what trauma actually looks like, how trauma is dealt with. Um, and in the research that I particularly do, which is with younger adults in Japan and Korea, the ordinariness I define as the humble and seemingly uneventful, here again working off of Das and Povinelli. And I define ordinariness as a kind of desire, which I think might also um, be a way to help think through what it means to look for social inclusion strategies among certain kinds of marginalized younger adults. Um, I think of desire is quite important because alignments towards broad social discourses can tell us about the shape of the world and its limitations and exclusions. What we want tells us about what we imagine as possible and what we don't imagine as at all in existence. So linguistically enacted desire in Japanese might be, for example, yarikai koto, the things that I want to do, which younger adults often use to describe the imagination of their future possibilities, what those possibilities look like, and also what is seen as not possible. Also things that are labeled as tanoshi, so fun things, things that are um, described positively. So now I'm just gonna turn to two short examples from my own research, which again have to do with younger adults who are not excluded um, from social life because of intellectual de or developmental disabilities, but because of socioeconomic or um, geographic facts. So uh, for one example to think through is comes from a young actor, Takeru Sato, is a relatively famous actor actually, who describes the changes in um, younger adults that he knows um, particularly younger adults who um, he knows who are not um, as successful as he is. And he describes that there is a change in what younger adults want out of a desirable life. And he says, what is important is the happiness of, ooh, of was repeated there, <laughs> going to Chiba with friends for a one night, two day barbecue. What is becoming popular with young people are values like the relationships with people close to one and the importance of small happinesses. We don't think things like tomorrow will be better than today. Um, and they, and then he kind of switches to talk about younger adults generally, they don't hope for things like the rebirth of the Japanese economy. So what he's arguing is that younger adults who are in many ways facing a severe set of social and economic challenges in Japan are redefining um, what counts as an ordinary life rather than focusing on things like a full-time job, marriage, and home ownership. They're focusing on everyday happinesses, on local as opposed to you know more broadly spread out geographic um, relations and on the personal, right? So the happiness of going to Chiba for a one night, two day barbecue, Right? So that's like everyday happiness that doesn't actually require a great deal of economic investment. Relationships with people that are close to you. So those are people who are close to you in terms of your geography, but also emotionally. So rather than expanding one social network, focusing on a smaller sense of social network and on the importance of small happinesses, which is you know, a sense of personal happiness. So here you have a change in the mindset of what counts as a good life. And it's a life that is turned towards ordinariness as a limit in a sense, right? This is the limit of our aspiration. But ordinariness can also function as a way to, ex to navigate exclusion and marginalization more broadly. And here I want to look through 
more carefully, um, the use of ordinary itself, so the term ordinary kutsu in Japanese, for this uh, young woman um, in her 20s who's describing how difficult um, her life is at the moment and how she is reimagining ordinariness in light of her present circumstances and is different to the circumstances of her parents' generation. So she says, during the night, to be able to sleep kutsumi ordinarily without sleeping pills is the goal that she wants to, one of the goals that she has. She then claims that she was born into an ordinary, a futsuna, salaryman household. So salarymen are white collar workers and they constitute what would be considered the broader middle and upper middle class in Japan. And while I hated my ordinary self, right, I was enchanted by the ordinary. So she both sees ordinariness as a trap and as something that she longs for. And then says, even though there isn't a definition of ordinary, is there? And the ordinary changes. I wonder what ordinary life is under these circumstances. And then, then as a sort of like thinking through what is her imagination of this ordinary desirable life, if I'm able to trust in this in order to you know, trust in a kind of continuation of life and have peace, maybe that only is good. So here, futsu, ordinariness, functions as a site of significant negotiation, right? It's something that this um, young woman longs for. It's something that she previously rejected. So she sees both the normative pressures of ordinariness and ordinariness as a site of desire. But at the end of the day, what she's longing for is a reimagined ordinariness, right? Not the ordinariness of her salaryman household, the, the, the salaryman household that she grew up in, but rather an imagination of ordinariness where she is able to trust in this day and have peace, right? Trust in the moment as it is and have peace um, where the idea... Um, of unseen, right, safety and peace suggests potentially the continuation of this trust into the future. So what can this tell us? So I think in terms of doing research on younger adults, um, we can think about how to focus on the small and on the everyday. Rather than looking always towards broad social changes, we can think about how younger adults imagine their lives in the moment. We can attend to the possibilities for making things ordinary as a tactic of inclusion, right? Including younger adults who have intellectual and developmental disabilities in the act of ordinariness actually reimagines the possibilities of ordinariness itself. And thus, I believe, works to further the task of uh, social inclusion for younger adults, uh, regardless of their um, developmental abilities or disabilities because so many younger adults are now feeling so marginalized from so many aspects of social life. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. This was Dr. Judith Crew from Arizona State University. Thank you for joining us today in Warsaw. And we will continue uh, now onto the panel session. Uh, but uh, you can stay or disconnect as you wish, and uh, we'll, okay. we'll see you soon, hopefully. I will stay for okay. a little bit, then I have to go and teach a class, but I'd like to hear at least like one panel. So I'll turn my, my mic um, okay. and stop video, and then, yes, so, I'd be happy to Thank listen. you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, I would like to introduce to you now uh, Professor Martinus uh, Konradi from the Free, Free State University in South Africa. And I would like to re-invite uh, Dr. Stephanie Casilde um, from Belgium, uh, who will join Martinez in um, making a discussion with uh, students who joined us, uh, Erasmus students and local students. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. And now it's entirely up to you what you decide with your uh, panelists, whether you would like to stay here and uh, transmit the discussion or whether you would prefer to make it more informal. This is your choice. It's up to you. <laughs> Whatever feels comfortable. If, if you want to stay here, we can bring chairs in. If you don't want to stay here, we can go to the co-working area. 
it's up to how you feel safe. I mean, the students. We, we, we will be present for it, but we, we can transmit it or not, depending on how comfortable your students feel. That depends on them. Okay, fine. Okay, so it depends on how the students feel. Okay. Um, well, then I guess it's over to you guys to tell me. So I'll tell you a little bit of what, what we initially had in mind. The ideas we had was that we'll give all of these students an opportunity to sort of share their reactions to what they've heard and so that everybody else can sort of perhaps at the end join in if they want to. Uh, that's the format that I have had in mind. How do you guys feel? You, do you guys want to stick with what we planned? Yeah. Okay, you guys good with that? Yeah. So do you think we can sit here on this? I think that would be fantastic if we could do that. It would be, as you say, less. Yeah, but remember, what would they be sitting on? Mm -hmm. I can, I can project without this. Okay, I'm just gonna. What would they be sitting on, though? Floor. I'll sit with you throughout. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe. Uh, yeah, okay. well, I was thinking we'd bring up the chairs. It's fine. You can also bring Just so, bring chairs. how many of them do we have? Just raise your hands. Like, I know. So we do it properly. Okay, so you can uh, maybe move it to the side. One more for because this is the okay, fine. We do need one more. Otherwise, I can stand. I'm happy with standing. Okay. okay. You don't want to break those two up. That's that's not a good idea. I think something really bad is going to happen if we break them up. Okay, then maybe as a kickoff, let me just sort of give you guys a sense of what it is that we planned. Um, so, we have a number of students here, some of them Polish students from the APS and others Erasmus students, and the arrangement that we had was that they would attend as many of the presentations as they could and then share their thoughts based on what they've heard, and I promised them a warm and collegial reception from you guys, and I hope that you will do exactly that. Um, and thank you to all of you for being willing to participate and to share your ideas and your responses to what you've heard. I'm going to maybe just, uh, just to set the tone, I'm going to sort of uh, kick off the discussion with some of my thoughts and some of my responses to what we've heard so far. Then we'll pass the microphone around and you guys will just sort of share 
what you liked, what was thought-provoking, and some of the questions that you might have. So I guess I'll kick off by saying that this is perhaps a little selfish for me. I found a lot of the discussions around the evolutions of uh, you know, contemporary developments very interesting, especially the very first presentation, which sort of outlined how as people are living much longer than they used to, we need to rethink the way that impacts people who live with disabilities. What I sort of wanted to see a little bit more of is attention to the centrality of discourse in the way that disabilities and so forth are socially constructed. That is a little selfish for me. I enter these conversations as a discourse analyst and would, I guess, predictably want to see more discourse analysis. But that is where the last presentation actually entered for me, the one by Judith Crew that we just listened to. I thought, you know, trying to center the way that ordinariness is itself negotiated and constructed. I found that a very productive way of thinking about a range of other topics that were introduced earlier. You know, what is disability? It is something that is fundamentally uh, socially and discursively constructed and negotiated. It is not simply its particular neurological imprints. And so I thought that was very productive of her. Um, it does provoke for me a range of questions about things like, you know, what would we like inclusion to be? And in many of the presentations, I hear the words inclusion and social participation. What I heard less of is how these concepts are conceptualized. What do we want them to mean in concrete terms? And again, that's where I found the last presentation quite uh, illuminating, because these are things that can be negotiated. There is, in my view, a certain risk if academics end up speaking on behalf of those they want to see included and those they want to have, you know, participate more in whatever way that means. But if what it means to be ordinary and if what inclusion is and social participation is, is negotiated, then there might be ways of actively involving those on whose behalf we speak. Um, in particular, there's a concept that I work with which is called creative maladjustment. The sort of, in my view, touches on what the last speaker mentioned. The idea that there are some social norms like ordinary, ordinariness, which are fundamentally negotiated. And I should add a little bit of background here. My main focus is on critical race theory. I deal primarily with questions around racism, not disability. But, so for me, that is useful because the idea of behind creative maladjustment is that there are some norms that are oppressive and that one should not be adjusted to, that one should not embrace, but find ways of maladjusting against. So if ordinariness, if inclusion and participation and disability are all discursively constructed, then we ought to think carefully about identifying those criteria, those metrics that might be oppressive and how we might renegotiate them. So those are some of my thoughts. These are a few takeaways for me that stood out for me during the presentation. I'm going to pass the microphone on now so that the students can speak for themselves and you'll just basically introduce yourselves and give us a very quick take of um, what you found thought provoking, what was constructive and what you might have wanted to hear more about, that sort of thing. Okay, cool, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Nicola and I am a student from APS. Uh, I couldn't attend all of the, uh, the conference from the start, but I think it was really important topics and as, especially for us young adults and students, uh, the things that we don't really talk about in uh, classes or every day. So it's really nice to have an opportunity like that to participate in uh, this conference. Uh, I also find the last um, subject really interesting and I think it's, uh, well, it was, mm, I don't know how to say that. It was really like, um, made me like think about it more and I would like to know about it more. 
I think that some topics were um, like um, in general so there when there weren't that specific and I would like to know more about but it's really nice that there were emails and you can I think contact uh, someone and um, get to know more about it uh, and yeah I think for now that's it <laughs> Hi, I'm Amelia. Uh, their speeches was very inspiring. For me, they touch uh, on important topic of, of for society. Uh, in a word, I liked it, uh, and I'm a little stressed sitting here. So, hello, my name is Isabella. I am also an APS student, and first of all, I am super glad to be here today and to hear such important subjects. And I know for now that I will have to pay more attention to some of them. And uh, the one that was most important for me, the most interesting was the last one by uh, Dr. Judith and the ordinariness. I think it's very important for our daily lives and Uh, hi, I'm Martina. I'm also a APS student. Uh, I liked all the presentation, but um, I like um, when uh, guests talk more about uh, re real life sit situations. So the um, mm, the presentation with the um, American guests uh, were the most interesting for me. Hi, uh, I'm Marie. I'm one of the Erasmus students, and um, back home I study special needs education in Germany. So I found the topic about special needs in education in Poland um, really interesting, and um, also how the history and how it changed is like quite similar. Um, and also how um, in Poland there are like more categories for them to, um, yeah fit into so I think that's like a huge advantage from Poland and also the um, subject of ordinariness was very inspiring I think to come back to um, or to value ordinariness more in the daily life. Hi um, my name is Patricia I'm also a Erasmus student I'm from Slovenia and I was only able to attend the last presentation but actually the topic of inclusion is really close to me because before I arrived to Erasmus I was actually working on a RPS pro 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 project uh, in Slovenia, which was inclusion in hockey. Uh, um, I'm a social worker, though, studying social work, so this was a weird topic for me. But uh, I kind of see how hard it is to include people that have different disabilities. But I think it's because we sometimes stop trying and need to get out of our comfort zone and don't look at the differences, but look at the sim similarities. When we did that project, it was really successful when we actually had an event of uh, inviting uh, kids from a uh, special needs school. And they had so much fun and they didn't see us as different because we didn't look at them as different. And we invited them on the ice skating ring and tried to include them on actually doing the sports. And I don't know how the situation of this is around the world. I didn't search it up around. Do they have like inclusion in sports especially for kids with special needs. But I think in Slovenia we are really trying and trying to make it possible for everyone to um, feel included. Um, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to be here for more presentations. I maybe could be able to uh, relate more, but thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Dorota and I'm also a Erasmus student. Um, and I also just attended the last two um, lectures and I thought it was really interesting because I'm also studying in Germany. Um, and for me, both lectures were very interesting. The first one was very interesting because I was thinking about how um, disability and also special needs education could have worked out differently if history was different, if there wasn't the World War II, for example. Um, so that was something I was thinking about actually while we were 
listening to the lecture, how history also impacts, um, yeah, disability, disability and um, this this constructed idea of disability, basically. And so I thought that the the last lecture also connected to that very well, um, to kind of reimagine how or question um, the constructiveness, I guess, um, of those social categories like disability or race or gender. So yeah, I don't really know what else to say, but I, but I really enjoyed it. Hello, I am Faye. I'm an Erasmus student from Greece. And in Greece, I study kindergarten education. So the presentation about special education was really interesting for me. I sadly couldn't attend a lot of the presentations, only the last two, but I found them really interesting. Okay, thank you very much. So I just want to close off, give you guys an opportunity if there is a particular topic, because you are speaking to a group of academics who specialize in the area of inclusion, participation, special needs. If there is anything in particular that you felt might have been missing or something that you feel should have attracted more attention during the presentations, um, I think it would be productive for everyone here to hear some of these things. So maybe as a kickoff, during some of the lectures that we shared, one of the topics that we discussed is the regularity with which people who live with disabilities are often constructed as the recipients of charity, the recipients of care, and those who need our intervention, need our activism, but they are not regularly constructed or seen or envisioned as people who have their own unique contributions to make to society, who can teach us who might reach out to us. In other words, there is an inherent inequality in the way that these positionalities are socially negotiated. And I thought, I mean, these are all topics that they generated on their own, I should add. That is not something that I introduced. That is a topic that they uh, brought to the table during our lectures. So given that you guys are clearly capable of like wonderfully insightful contributions, um, is there anything, like a topic of research or anything that you feel you'd like to bring to the audience's attention, something you feel isn't getting the attention that it deserves and that you'd like to share with us. Anything? Okay, I, I won't Absolutely. do the same either. <laughs> um, but I wish to share also with you maybe like um, methodological positioning. So I'm not working on uh, disability currently. Uh, and so when I attend a conference like this, what I think about, uh, what I have in mind, and in fact I, I took notes, of course, but at the same time in my mind, I have one part of my mind related to extremely pragmatic situation, and another part of my mind toward my research uh, questions and how I can transfer or build bridges between what I'm hearing during the presentation and my own research. And so here, uh, I need to um, reveal something that um, my mother is disabled. I mean, she uh, had a polio when she was uh, young. Uh, and so uh, I'm like, um, uh, physical disability is my ordinary in that sense. <laughs> and so uh, when I hear uh, all the presentation about this subject and I see um, uh, the evolution, um, um, it's extremely, I found it extremely positive and that still there, there are research about it and uh, uh, so um, I was touched, I mean, by uh, all, the, all the presentation and maybe I can share one small anecdote also about my mother because we were speaking about also the education and so uh, it was like only I will put uh, uh, only a physical disability, but um, uh, a father needed to ask the teacher if uh, she can just sit in the classroom. The, the teacher does not have to pay any attention, special attention to her, but just 
to leave her in the classroom, assist to the class, and my grandmother was uh, taking her to the school, at lunch taking back and went again to the school and went back. It was not close by, so she had to, to at one point learn how to conduct um, a car to, to bring her uh, to school. Um, and uh, why uh, my grandfather was thinking like that, it, he was born in uh, 1915, and for him, uh, my mother was not won't be chosen by any man to be married. So she, uh, it was mandatory to find a way for her to be able to take care of herself because my grandfather at one point will be dead. And so, I, I mean, this was all this kind of uh, thinking behind this situation and what to do. So this is just one anecdote and a special case, but what are in the mind of all the, the parents also of the children and, um, and so on? And yes, so I, I, I think all the, the, the questions that were raised today are really important and may have extremely uh, concrete um, uh, effect. And from the other side, so <laughs> I'm uh, uh, researching the trajectories of uh, 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 people experiences homelessness. And during the whole presentation, I, I was like thinking, okay, and if I take the situation of being homelessness as a disability, to, to, so to, to make this like this, what I can open or not through my thinking uh, in order to catch things that I did not, I'm not able to see or analyze or conceptualize yet toward uh, this situation. And uh, yes, so that I, I don't have more, so I, I took notes, but then it's not the place to do it in, in depth, but uh, at least it uh, helped me to open new way uh, to try to deal with that, or at least to uh, try to question myself about it. Yes. To, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any, any last contributions from anyone? Thank you guys so much for showing up. Then I'm going to end uh, on a note of gratitude to everyone here. And this is, again, on a somewhat personal note with my own scholarship, because like I said, the work that I do stems from critical race theory. And as I guess most of you guys know, intersectionality is one of the cornerstones of the work. And to be honest, I mean, I know intellectually that if you talk about intersectionality, you talk about race, gender, and socioeconomic status, and of course, ableism and disability has to feature in the mix. That I know that intellectually, and yet it has, honestly, not featured in any of my published work so far at all. And it's one of the reasons that I need to attend conferences like this, to equip myself and to expose myself to those who are better versed in the field. And on that, from that perspective, thank you very much. Right, and thanks to you guys for being here. I appreciate it very much. All right, thanks everyone.